thank you for joining the uh, the roundtable on uh, DMTA Section 512 reform. Um, <clears throat> Nancy and I um, really want this to be a true roundtable, and we're hoping uh, that there will be um, ample participation. Um, so I hope that you have come ready to discuss your thoughts on on, on the DMCA and Section 512. Um, before we get going, I've been asked to uh, to thank our sponsors, uh, uh, who we uh, are grateful to for making the conference possible: uh, CDAS, uh, StockTrek, Image Rights, Pick Rights, Smart Frame, Capture, and especially Google. Uh, thank you very much for for sponsoring. Um, now, uh, Nancy and I have. Uh, created a couple prompts to hopefully get the discussion going. Um, and let me share my screen to get that going. Okay. Um, so uh, I, I'll just give a, a quick overview of what we're, we're looking to talk about. Um, so just in general, um, if hopefully you can read through these and they're, they're sparking some, uh, some interest. Um, but in general, we want to talk about the need for reform. We want to hear your, your war stories, uh, talk about how much reform is necessary. Um, uh, we want to talk about uh, take down and stay down. Is that something that, that people are interested in? Uh, let's, let's talk some about red flag knowledge um, and, and uh, incentives. Uh, what incentives should there be uh, to get people to work together on this? Um, Standard technical measures is, is a topic that many are interested in. Um, also voluntary measures and, and uh, case act. And then also we're open to talk about what, whatever, whatever you like. Um, so uh, before we get going uh, on those, um, hoping that, um, that you all have some sort of background on the DMCA, uh, but maybe we can give a little bit of background. N Nancy, do you want to? You want to handle that? Section 512, and we're really talking about Section 512C predominantly, but Section 512 is part of the Digital Millennial Millennium Copyright Act that was a compromise made 20 years earlier between content owners and then the nascent um, internet. It was the era of dial up, AOL, I think CompuServe. And the fear was that since copyright is a strict liability um, statute where essentially if you reproduce, distribute, display, broadcast, you violate copyright and uh, monetary damages can be sought against you. The fear was that there would be so many what we would call ISPs or OSPs, online service providers. Um, that would be liable for copyright infringement for acts that are either necessary to the functioning of the internet or because of user generated content. And we're gonna focus on 512C, which is user generated content. So the, what happened was Congress uh, came up with this balance by uh, listening to both sides, the, the internet, companies and the owners that uh, there should be, or there, and the balance was based on a cooperation. So there would be essentially a safe harbor where internet service providers, if they met certain qualifications and got a proper notice that there was infringing content on their site, if they uh, took the content down expeditiously, a word never you know, defined, that they would uh, be immune from monetary damages. Uh, and this is what has evolved to this, what we call the notice and takedown. Um, and how it's evolved over the last 20 years is that the internet has grown, as you can see, tremendously. The, some of the largest countries in the companies in the world are uh, ISPs or OSPs as they're called now. And the burden on those that have to rely on this notice and takedown has become more and more onerous. Um, the, it's called the game of whack-a-mole where you 
find infringing content, you send a notice, it gets taken down and it comes right back up. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of um, discussion now and uh, the Copyright Office took the lead in reviewing whether you know, there needed to be some reform. Um, and so some of the areas we're gonna concentrate on are the areas where we think that, uh, or the Copyright Office and others think that there could be a readjustment of this balance, maybe not a total, you know, starting from scratch, which would be impossible. These kind of it takes forever to change laws. Uh, but there are things uh, that can perhaps be changed. Like, for example, in order to qualify, you need to have a repeat infringer po policy, but there's no statutory requirement uh, about how you adopt and implement that. It can be just an informal policy and issues should it be formal. Um, the idea that online service providers to maintain their qualifications that they're you know, essentially not curators of many of these sites have taken a position that it's almost hear no evil, see no evil. The less you know about a site, the more likely it is that you will qualify because you won't know about any infringing activity on your site. Um, so this, whether there should be a duty to monitor, whether there should be more incentives to work with content owners to ease the burden. So as you can imagine, the internet service providers think section 512 is just peachy and perfect. And those who um, have a lot of in works infringed thinks it's a nightmare. So we're gonna start talking about some of these areas um, and particularly the 512C where, we, where we're dealing with hosting of content. Um, the other ones deal with things like caching, which don't involve us too much and just being the conduit um, and linking. So let's move on. Uh, oh, I also didn't mention that in order to qualify, you have to be have a registered agent uh, with the Copyright Office and have information on your site about uh, who and where to send an email if you have a copyright complaint. Let's go. Uh, Great. I, I think that's a, that's a think really that's a good, good overview. Background. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. Um, so, and, and uh, just uh, another housekeeping uh, measure. If you, if you do wanna speak, uh, we're hoping that you can unmute yourself um, and speak. So just raise your hand if you would like to speak. Um, by going into the participants uh, button and then uh, pressing the raise hand uh, next to your name. Um, and then we'll know that you wanna talk and we can unmute you. Um, so uh, we might as, well, might as well go into it. So let's, uh, let's, let me read the first prompt um, and, and hopefully that will spur some conversation. So Nancy touched on this briefly, um, but the, the US Copyright Office has been thinking about um, reform for Section 512 for quite some time. And in May, they finally issued um, this long anticipated report. And they noted that the balance that Congress intended between online service providers or OSBs um, and the content owners is askew. And that is that it is skewed to the detriment of rights holders. Um, do you agree with this assessment, um, or or not, or is there something something in between? And I, um, since uh, since I don't see anyone's hand yet, I would say for the most part, uh, rights holders are, are are definitely in agreement with this. As Nancy had to had um, had said that the, the online content service providers or the platforms are, have come into this, you know, this discussion saying, there's nothing wrong with this, this, this works. Um, you know, if, if a rights holder wants to have their content taken down, all they have to do is send a notice and we'll, we'll do that. Um, you know, the problem is, and I think that the Copyright Office really recognized in its report is that it doesn't, it doesn't really work that well for rights holders. You have to find exactly where the um, the infringement is and you have to identify it and then you have to send a specific notice to get that content taken down. Um, and, and as we know, in the context of you know social media, once an image is up there, it is going to get shared and it's going to be all over the place. And so finding every place where your content is being infringed is 
is a game of, of whack-a-mole. And, you know, most rights holders do not have hundreds or thousands of, of people on staff that all they do is, is try to take uh, content down. Um, and so, so, yes, I think, you know, I would say from the perspective of Getty Images, we would say, yes, it is a skew. Um, and would anybody else like to weigh in on that? Well, maybe, should we move to war stories? I wonder, has anyone here had experience with trying to, you know, monitor content um, by relying on the DMCA and sending notices? Uh, you know, what, what are some of your experiences out there? Um, anyone anyone want to dare to be the first one to speak? We have way too shy a group. <laughs> I think I was just unmuted. This is Leslie. <clears throat> Nancy, it's not really an answer to your question, but I do have a question for you all. I'm still trying to understand the takedown and stay down. Can you guys explain that a little bit more? Because, you know, as you said, it's the whack-a-mole game where if you can get them to take it down, you know, you have that success, but then it just pops back up. So explain to me a little bit more how that works. Yeah, so, so take down and stay down is not something that is currently in the law. Um, that is something that rights holders have been asking for as part of, of part of reform. And so the idea is that you you give notice that something's infringing, that you that there's no authorization for it to be on this platform, and then there would be some sort of obligation on that platform to make sure that the content doesn't go back up. So um, Article 17 in the EU Copyright Directive is kind of, you know, it, it's pretty much this. Um, you know, it, it's a little bit of an oversimplification of it, but that that's the concept. So once a um, a platform has been notified that there is an authorization, then they have an obligation to monitor and make sure that that same content doesn't get put up again without authorization. So there there are a lot of problems with this there are, there are user groups that you know that um that feel that this is infringing on their right of free speech uh there you know this can be used for censorship and you know that there's this concept that there would be over filtering so i think that the the copyright office at least in its report i identified that and said you know this is something that that we can look into but they've, they've really taken the position that they wanna see what happens with the implementation of, um, of Article 17 before they even um, start thinking about it, about it here. And I, and I think that it is gonna be a bit of an uphill battle uh, to get something like this in the, in the US, um, but it's something that you know, it, it could certainly help rights holders avoid that game of whack-a-mole. Um, and I think it's something you know, that if, if it is something that, that we want as an industry, I think we have to be clear about it and it's something that we need to advocate. So if it's, you know, for the people in this room, you know, I put that question out there. Is, that, is this something that is really important to, to you um, to avoid this, you know, this constant game of whack-a-mole to sort of shift the burden a bit to the platforms to have to do a little bit more policing of their content? I'll uh, ask a follow-up, but I, I would answer your question. Anyone who's trying to go after this, I think it would be useful if they can figure it out because it's just such a wasted energy if you're going after these and you get them to take them back down and they pop back up. But my follow-up is this is really then platform specific, right? That they are saying that the platform has to continue monitoring. So the group could go to a different platform and post that content again. And, and this doesn't address that. Is that right? Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there still needs to be some sort of, of notice given. Um, you know, you can't theoretically just say a platform has an obligation to never post any content or never allow its users to post any content that is uh, protected by copyright. How, you know, it, it is a bit onerous to say you have to know who owns everything. Right. And it, it's also difficult when there's concepts like fair use. So sometimes it's appropriate to have content displayed without, um, you know, the owner's permission. And then there's a lot of 
heritage and older work where sort of copyright ownership is unknown. So copyright is never easy and never black and white. And that's one of the issues when you deal with internet service providers. I mean, basically zeros and ones are on and off switches. So, you know, they want, they want this, the, the tube always to be on. They don't want anything that shuts things down. Um, and, you know, copyright claims and trademark claims and things like that, you know, sort of shut down content. Um, the unfortunate thing is that copyright then gets equated with free speech, which is a problem where it's really not. I mean, it's about protecting, you know, creative property that someone owns and it, it really doesn't prevent free speech because it doesn't prohibit ideas from being shared. You can have the same, you could have a similar idea and just express it a different way. But um, that's part of sort of what's become the, the copyright wars is that it, it uh, gets equated with speech. I think this notice and stay downs would work a lot, would be helpful if some of the largest platforms where many, a lot of content was on could work more with content owners. And maybe we'll talk about that later with incentives. But if there are certain sites where you see the most infringement, I don't know if anyone here has any particular, you know, war stories or not, but for example, like a lot of things you can find, you know, works up on Redbubble or, you know, do people have an interest, with, um, have an issue with Pinterest or, um, you know, things being sold on eBay or, you know, other types of sites where uh, there's such large traffic of content, it would, it would be helpful if there was some kind of uh, relationship that we could build. Yeah, I, I see that we have one hand up right now. Uh, it looks like uh, Gail. Gail Perry would like to to ask a question or be. Hi. Hello, everyone. Hi, Gail. Hi, Gail. Hi, Gail. Hi, Gail. Hi, so my, my question experience is, what about where there's competing copyright interests where somebody makes a copyright claim that's unfounded and then you find your content either at risk of being taken down I, obviously youtube used to have the three strikes thing you know where what are your thoughts on that and what you know are the recent discussions on dealing with unfounded claims and trolls and the lot yeah do you want me to to respond there Nancy? yeah you yeah. can start and i can add whatever okay. you like yeah so i think you know part of the the mechanism that is already in 512 is that there is the opportunity for if someone has their content removed to ha to file a counter notice and so they would be able to object if there was if their content had been removed um, unfairly and so you know that could happen if you want to um, dispute the claim that the person who asked to have it taken down is actually the owner and you think you're the owner um, you know, or often it is the case where counter notice will be based on someone thinking that it is fair use. Um, and then, you know, what, what happens is, you know, there, there is dispute uh, mechanism for that, but ultimately, and this is, I think, part of the problem with, uh, with the, the way that 512 is currently set up, is that um, the platforms will often put up their hands when a dispute can't be resolved. And they'll be like, well, you need to bring a federal um, infringement suit against that. So the rights holder would have to bring a federal infringement suit against the um, uh, in, uh, uh, infringer. Um, and that is, you know, very, it, it, it really doesn't make sense, right? In, in yeah. the context of when you're trying to just do a takedown to have to bring a, um, a, a federal lawsuit, which is very expensive, it just in order to um, you know dispute someone's say claim of fair use or uh, of ownership, and so I think there 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 are problems there, and it you know there's definitely abuse of the takedown system that has been documented, um, and I think that's part of reform is to think about how that 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 can be fixed. We put in uh, one of the prompts here is how can the case act um, be. Uh, be involved in reform, you know, and that might be one of the, the cases. Maybe these sorts of disputes should be handled by the um, the judicial system that is contemplated by the Case Act. Obviously, the Case Act needs to get enacted first before you can start using it for other things. Um, but I think that that is that's part of part of the problem that needs to be solved. 
Uh, yes, I've had some examples, if a couple of war stories. Sometimes people will use the copyright takedown really to inappropriate try to prevent a competitor from being successful in a space. Uh, and, you know, there's uh, the, uh, which we mentioned, I mentioned earlier, is you need to have a repeat infringer policy. And that means if a, if a site is getting a complaint from the same uh, party who's uploading allegedly infringing content, there has to be at some point action to take them off the site. But sometimes there's abuse in that area where the, the complaints really aren't legitimate or they're, they're really you know, based on ideas um, or something else. But predominantly, uh, you know, the, the, the abuses get highlighted, but I think there are so many more legitimate uh, takedowns that just make everyone weary. Um, but but uh, Paul's right. Yeah, I, I just had a, a client in a dispute with someone over some 3D modeling and all the other side had to do in the middle of a federal litigation about this was to tell the app store that they thought the content was infringing. And then the app store took down the apps because they didn't want to be involved, which means we basically were had a shotgun to the head and had to settle because without the apps out making money, there wasn't going to be a business. So, um, yeah, nothing's perfect. Um, and, you know, most of the platforms just don't want to be involved in copyright disputes. So uh, I was just, can you hear me? Yep, we can still oh, hear you. I was yep. just going to add to that uh, also the experience with, you know, content ID crawls that are inaccurate and legitimately licensed content. You know, there's a full time business just <laughs> trying to counter all the, you know, the, the, uh, mess ups in the content ID crawls that send out that, you know, go straight to the um, service providers. And then, you know, the other, the, the licensee gets notice. And then, you know, you have to start spending all your time um, undoing it. And there's a lot of admin that goes with that and cost. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I, I think that that might be a, um a good transition into talking about standard technical measures. And if you want to jump around a little bit, um, but you know, so, and I, I can can read that prompt now. So, in the in the 22 years since the DMCA was enacted, standard technical measures are referred to as STMs or technical solutions. Um, they're envisioned by a Section 512I, they, but they've never they've never been implemented. Um, and you know what are you know the biggest hurdles to implementing technological solutions? And and we're talking about the things that you know you're you're talking about, Gail. So um, uh, technical measures that can match um, match right holder content and and you know send an automated takedown or or you know for platforms to be able to monitor for things that are likely infringing and to take that down. Um, and why has why have we never been able to come to some consensus on this? Um, you know, I, I think there's obvious reasons in that the platforms aren't really there's no motivation for them to come to the table. Um, that you know that said, they have they have implemented certain things. Um, you know, famously, uh, Google or, or YouTube has um, their their content ID, um, which. Uh, you know, I think Gail, as you alluded to, there's lots of issues with. Um, but is it possible for you know automatic filtering um, to uh, of infringing content to be effective? Um, you know, what about fair use rights and and how much human involvement is is needed? Um, yeah, and so I, I would love to hear from you know some of the the people in here that are potentially in the in the world of um, you know, image enforcement um, that that know that technology. Um, you know, what why what what can we do to to make the world or at least uh, Congress comfortable that that technical measures are possible to at least solve some of the problems here? No, I mean the, the challenge for the platforms to implement that kind of technology is understanding what what content is actually. Uh, 
content that needs to be protected and uh, and understanding what what to be filtered out. And so that has to be done. I mean, that's a lot of resources uh, to be able to do that. And so only the biggest players could even uh, be in a position to to try to do that. I think that's you know that's what is going to be kind of challenging for platforms in Europe uh, to abide by you know, Article 17 and things going on over there. Um, so yeah, I, I just think it's just such a, a difficult uh, challenge just because it's not just the technology, it's then understanding which content uh, really needs to be filtered out. And so I, I think that's what is going to make it very difficult. Do you think in looking at the reform that any reform should make a difference between the smaller platforms and the larger platforms and the type of voluntary measures or standard technical measures that would be expected of them? You know, if, for example, a large platform worked with the uh, DMLA industry and, uh, you know, we could provide them with a database of content, if that would even work, would that be helpful? Yeah, I mean, it, it depends kind of how cynical you are, right? Like, if, first of all, they have to be motivated. And uh, if they don't think it's going to help the bottom line, then, you know, then it really, really require punitive uh, measures to, to drive enforcement. And, and if that's the case, uh, and again, this is kind of what's going on in Europe, um, then it's extremely unfair to the smaller companies. Uh, because you have the larger companies that would have the ability to uh, meet the requirements because they have the, the money and the resources to do it uh, and could be dragged into doing it. Uh, but the smaller companies and any, anybody beyond just the, the biggest platforms wouldn't really be able to do that. So um, I think it has to deviate as far as how it's handled between the largest platforms and the smaller uh, you know, companies out there uh, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's something that has been talked about, um, you know, in, in reform is you, ha you might want to have different standards for, for the larger companies that are, are dominant um, than, you know, startups. And, and, and for instance, you know, um, the copyright directive in Europe, which you're talking about, there, there is a differentiation um, where, you know, the larger companies are going to be obligated to use some sort of technology smaller companies, uh, startups that have, you know, been in business for, for a short period of time, don't have those same obligations. And I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, especially as, you know, we see these, these tech companies that are in power, you know, their power becoming more and more dominant. Um, and it's, you know, if we want to see innovation in, in these areas, you, you might not want to, um, to limit. And, and actually, you know, going back to why this Congress put this into place, place in the in the first place right it was to spur innovation in the internet which 22 years ago was very very different than it is now um and you know to support these these big or what were were now big companies but were just in their infancy at that point um you know a lot of people point to to this section as well as um you know some other other laws as really making the internet companies uh, what they are today um, I, I see that we have another hand up from from Barry McGrath, who is the um, uh, the the compliance manager at Getty Images. So I'm sure he has some good war stories to share. Oh, good. Indeed. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, it's it's whack a mole is is an understatement. You know, I could spend the rest of my life doing takedowns from, you know, the reports we get from our contributors externally, from employees, just our content. Um, I mean, I'm not going to name any specific platforms, but let's say the major platforms, it's, you know, you got a case of, as, as Nancy had said earlier, you know, and I think Paul said as well that you, you know, you do a takedown for a seller uh, selling, you know, Getty images content. Um, and then they, you know, the, 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 the takedown happens and then the very next day they're back up again. You know, that's like, I'll be specific on that. That's like on eBay, they have that happening and they're supposed to, you know, adhere to the red flag knowledge. So we're, we're trying to address that with eBay. Um, and then um, like with the 
Twitter. It's, um, you know, I get pushback from Twitter on certain content, um, you know, even though we'll have a Getty Images watermark on it, they'll refuse to take it down. Or where someone's using our trademark, they'll refuse because, for example, I couldn't um, show that we had a trademark rights in the Netherlands. You know, even though this is global and it's Getty Images, it's our literal logo being showed, uh, being shown on the platform um but it's it's i mean something needs to happen because it's it's impossible to stay on top of this i mean literally impossible it cannot be done um people just put our content you know selling getty images content imagery um uh, or just merely displaying it uh, like on the likes of twitter and instagram um you know and then you can do a takedown it goes back up again the next day and it's just it is impossible to stay on top of I don't know what the solution is, but but there needs to be more liability on the platforms as far as I'm concerned. Do you think that these platforms will ever work with, say, the the visual licensing industry? So, you know, for example, right now, um, YouTube will work with the motion picture industry and a lot of the, the major labels and music. Um, and they have kind of arrangements and there's incentives because there's some advertising rev share. There's never been any reach out to our industry. Um, do you think without some statutory incentives that there's any voluntary measures that would work for this industry? Um, I mean, it must be annoying for these large platforms to also have to spend money taking these all down, but you, it, um, it seems that the way the cases have construed red flag, red flag knowledge that none of these platforms sort of want to get involved because they're, you know, I think they probably have, you know, the, the lawyer saying them, the less you do, you know, the better your protection is. And um, right. Uh, um, yeah, and I, I, I think I feel the teeter totter went way off. Yeah, and I think there's a, like a fundamental, like I've been doing, you know, copyright enforcement for, and you know, over a decade. And I think they're like, everybody knows you can't download or, or put on a movie on a platform or put music on a platform, but people don't seem as conscious about images, you know, photography. They just don't seem to be as aware that it's the exact same for photography as somebody else's work. You can't display it without, without permission, you, you know. Um, and I think it's even true of the platforms. They just don't take it seriously. You know, even though like our sole industry is imagery and a bit of video, um, that's our livelihood. It's everybody works again. It's all our photographers. It's our livelihood, but it's not taken seriously at all. Um, and I think there needs to be that needs to be more to the fore, maybe a big lawsuit. Like, you know, I think everybody knows of Napster, you know, and then everybody learned, oh, you can't be uploading music to these platforms. Or, or, but I just don't think there's a consciousness of photography being at, at the fore. And I think that's that's a, a core thing that could, could improve. But, you know, again, I don't know how, just, you know, we need advocacy for it, but um, that's to me seems to be the problem. It's just not taken seriously. Oh, it's just a photo, who cares, you know? Yeah, and, and I can say that, you know, the, the Copyright Office has identified that um, to their credit, they've, they've done industry roundtables and they did do a roundtable that was, um, was focused on hearing, you know, from our industry, um, and there were um, there was a good uh, good amount of people that um, that were involved in that, and you know, and really made the the copyright office, and and there were also some um, some representatives from from Congress there aware of the unique challenges that we're facing. Um, you know, it's it's hard to tell in that. In that context, when sort of everyone's on your side, how that's being received, um, but but we do know that it that they are making an effort to to hear it, um, at least. Uh, um, I think uh, Tom yeah, yeah. Tom was next. Yeah. Oh, it's, Nancy, unless you wanted to say something. No, no, I said I saw some hands up. So great. All right. Uh, yeah, this is Tom Smith from Gato Images. Um, you know, we're sort of in an, an interesting position because we're on the one hand a rights holder and on the other hand, <clears throat> we do a lot of work with people in the tech industry. Um, so we hear a lot about this from both sides, I would say. Um, and one of the things we hear from people in tech is that uh, kind of kind of what Nancy was alluding to, they're concerned that if they get involved in um, policing the content on, this, on their platforms that 
kind of an all or nothing thing. Like if they do that, then they will potentially not be considered a platform and they'll lose all of the um, safe harbor that they would have. Um, and so they, they kind of would, I think they'd like to get more involved, but there's actually a fear sometimes that getting more involved is gonna jeopardize that. And so um, instead of even coming to the table, it's easier to just um, you know, look the other way as you all have been kind of hinting at. But I think there's also a, a realization on, in the, on the tech side that um, you know, this, is, this kind of content can be really bad for users and also the hands-off approach that they've, they feel at least that they have to take uh, in terms of moderating content because of the issues of avoiding, you know, jeopardizing the safe harbor means they can't moderate content as well for other reasons. So you have platforms that are afraid to remove, um, you know, really objectionable content that's very bad for users and, um, you know, abusive content and um, prejudiced content because they feel that if they get into uh, moderating what's on their platform and they get their hands into it, then they'll lose their, their safe harbor here. So I wonder um, if you can talk at all about are there other ways to approach the safe harbor aspects, which would allow these platforms to get more involved in moderating content, either for copyright or for other purposes, but would still be a, a shield for them, you know, for the kinds of things that were originally intended, like you know, a user uploads a, yep. uh, a copyrighted photo right. and uh, they don't notice it and, and they take it down in good faith. So I think this is a perfect example of where 512, you know, 22 years ago really didn't have an opportunity to think about how all this would play out later on. Um, and there isn't, there just isn't enough clarity about what you can do because on one hand, it, they encourage standard technical, med, standard technical measures, STMs, but the definition of it is, doesn't really comply in how they're created. Uh, then on the other hand, they also, uh, encourage sort of the hear no evil, see no evil. So as soon as you know about something and don't do it, you could lose your safe harbor. So perhaps this is where some additional language that would just clarify that if you take voluntary measures uh, within the industry to prevent infringement, that you're not uh, stepping over the line essentially of of now being the curator for this uh, and lose your safe harbor. Um, I know there's a number, you know, many members look at themselves also as a platform. Um, there's a case out of uh, Seattle district in the federal court where Pond5 was successful in claiming it was entitled to um, immunity for some content that a content owner uploaded, which didn't belong to them. And I'm sure every large photo or image library has had a case where they've gotten content from a contributor that really didn't belong to that contributor. And there is no way you would ever be able to know. I mean, you, we need to rely on contracts and representations from contributors that they own the content and it's permitted to be distributed or even with heritage contact that they you know believe the content wouldn't be infringing um, and so in some ways it would it would help us if there was also clarity about you know how much curation would be okay so you would get the benefits of this for for truly the content that you can't monitor and the best thing you can do is take it down um, so I think that is an area uh, that if Congress is going to start, you know, asking for feedback on that would be really helpful to sort of bring back those incentives that were initially uh, anticipated would happen, but it didn't really work as planned. And I think particularly some of the cases who have really read, and I don't know if everyone understands red flag knowledge, what that is, have really read part of the act out, which would be you know, if you get a, not just getting a notice saying this piece of content is infringing, but just so clear that certain content being uploaded should be infringing. Like if you're hosting a site that's called um, stolen images, I mean, can you look away? Right now you can. Um, 
And if you if you look under the hood too much, you could lose your protection. So everyone keeps the hood down, as you just mentioned. Yeah. Um, and I just want to add one other thing to um, to answer Tom your your question. Um, and there, I think there's confusion regularly about this. Um, that there, you know, there's another law uh, that that you're that is also in the news these days, called, uh, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which um, you know, talking about reform there. Um, that that does give the um, uh, the platforms a little bit more discretion of, of what to to take down. Um, and so I think that there is there is some confusion that that um, that goes along with that and that, you know, section 512 reform, you know, it's not it's not in a bubble, like you need to think about 230 as, as well a little bit. Um, Look, we I don't want to go into that too much. I think too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think um, I think Joe is actually next. Um, I think he's been trying to follow up on um, something that he had said earlier about STMs. And then Eric. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, actually, thanks. Um, I wanted to bring up another issue. It's really more, you know, and just talking about 512 reform in general, uh, one of the challenges is that even though it states what you're supposed to submit when you submit a notice uh, to, you know, some platform or company that's covered by uh, the MCA, it doesn't dictate how. And so it's not something that we've been able to effectively provide as a service to our copyright holders because every site has their own, their own form or you have to email this person. This And it's just, there's not a single method for reporting, which makes it very difficult when you're talking about the kind of scale uh, that exists as far as you know unwanted use uh, of the images. And then the other thing I wanted to uh, comment on or throw out there, and then I'd like to hear your thoughts, is you know, not every platform is the same. Nancy, you mentioned uh, Redbubble and you know there's Etsy and all these e-marketplaces. Um, they're not just a platform where people, you know, fans of a rock group are uploading images of that rock group. They're a commerce platform that profits off of anything being sold on their platform, which often includes uh, copyrighted material that's in, being infringed. And you know, it, it seems to me that reform should include additional teeth uh, for uh, a commerce platform beyond just having the, the, the stuff taken down. For example, uh, you know, at a minimum, you know, they already make it incredibly difficult to figure out who actually is behind the merchant that's selling the infringed material. Could you not have it be a requirement of their response to the uh, notice that they provide you the information on that merchant so that you can then follow up directly with them, potentially pursue the, the copyright infringement claim? As it is now, uh, they, the platforms, you know, they're, they're more incentive to have their merchants uh, continue selling through their platform. Um, and so they wanna make it as difficult as possible, or at least that's how it turns out as how you reach these merchants. And so they hide that information, but if they, they were forced to actually provide that, uh, that would save rights holders the hassle and the expense of the time of having to go and subpoena the platform to get that information uh, and so on. So I'd be curious to hear what y'all thoughts are on adding that kind of aspect uh, to the reform. Yeah, uh, Joe, Joe, can you remind me, what was the first thing that you had asked? The Joe? first one was having a single method. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The way you contact any site, any platform, uh, regardless of how big or small they are. Just yeah, any so, so that, that is something that the, the copyright offices report went into and look, looked at. So, so technically, um, the, the, um, the statute does say, you know, it, it lists what you need to have in a report and it's pretty simple, right? You need to identify the, um, the content that's being infringed, you know, show that you are the owner or, or you make a, um, a statement that, that you are the owner. Um, and, uh, 
uh, there are a couple other pieces, but it's really not that complicated. But what what has what you've seen is that um, uh, each platform then will kind of change the change it up, and they will make you know requirements that are not actually in the law. Um, so so theoretically, you should be able to send just a notice to the registered DMCA note. Uh, um, uh, I'm blanking on the name, it's a DMCA agent, sorry. Um, and if that agent gets it, and, and that there that agent needs to have a registered email address with the Copyright Office, um, they should then have to take action. But in reality, that doesn't happen. You know, what happens if you if you send the notice to say, for instance, Facebook, they'll be like, oh no, you have to send, you know, using our form. And that just makes the, the process of automating it much, much more difficult. Um, and and so so uh, the copyright office has noticed that. And I think that is definitely part of of the reform. That is is probably one of the easier things to to get is to maybe have a standardized form that should have to be used by um, by all platforms, um, and and really make it a little bit easier to to submit um, submit notices. Mm -hmm. um, and and then the other the other piece. Just to, there is some some recent case law on companies like Redbubble that um, that are producing like actual merchandise, um, and it has been more favorable to rights holders um, as the the case law has been been moving forward. Basically, if they have um, you know if they are taking uh, action. Um, in in actually making the the content, then they can't necessarily just rely on the DMCA. Um, so I think we're seeing some favorable movement there. Um, and then you know there is you kind of alluded to it with the subpoena, um, but there is in in the in the in the act there is um, a DMCA subpoena that really doesn't get used at all, and it's supposed to be an easier way to basically just get the names of the of the users or contact information for the users um, that uh, that that you want, so you can so you can potentially go after them. Um, but it, that I think that is another thing that probably needs to be fixed because it's not it's not being used. Right. So let's see what Eric has to say because I think he's been waiting for a little while. Just have a kind of a comment and a couple observations as as an outsider. Um, so, and where uh, my, are you from, Eric? Uh, I'm from Steg AI. Uh, so my background is actually in uh, machine learning and AI. Um, and uh, I'm the founder of this company. And as such, I've uh, actually been investigating uh, this topic of um, copyright law for about 18 months now, um, because this is something that our our startup is hoping that we can help with uh, in some way. And um, just a couple of observations. So um, prior to incorporating, uh, we performed over 100 customer discovery interviews and many of them were focused on uh, social media companies uh, and also rights holders. Um, and uh, just one kind of observation about the conflict that I've uh, noticed um, in technical solutions that have been proposed is that you know the rights holders seem to want detection tools that have more true positives and fewer false negatives so they want to catch every offense of their of their uh, content that's being wrongly shared uh, but kind of in indirect conflict social media platforms are adopting tools that have fewer false positives because they don't want to upset their users so, you know, the way I'm looking at this is uh, that right now there's a lack of a technical solution uh, that is kind of resulting in more operations costs uh, for both the social media companies, as Nancy mentioned before, and also for the rights holders, as uh, Barry mentioned before. Um, so just a very uh, brief plug, um, but we're still investigating this area. Uh, it's um, we're currently supported by the National Science Foundation and we're developing uh, some novel watermarking tech that we think might be of interest here. So if there's anybody who- if you um, could solve our problems, yay. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, I, that, that would be good for everyone. Um, yeah, so, you know, um, 
we're we're really looking for partners at this point. We're we're a very young startup. Um, so people in the uh, copyright space as owners, uh, somebody we could co-develop a pilot with. Uh, so you know, just my my brief call to action is, um, you know, I'd be happy to connect with anybody here um, who's interested in these problems, and just I'd like to learn more about your business either by uh, by LinkedIn or by email. So feel free to give me a shout. I'd I'd really appreciate it. Thanks, Eric. I, yeah, I think I I really appreciate that, and uh, it's it's good to know that people are working on technical solutions. Um, I would I would like to point out one one thing in this area um, is that you know I, I do think that there are there are really good solutions for for identifying content and like being able to find it. It's almost a commodity at this point, um, and you know as we've seen in you know copyright compliance operations. That it's you can find your uh, where your image is being used and and matching an image uh, using technology like finger like digital fingerprinting is is out there. I think the problem you know one of the the problems that really needs to be solved and and hopefully Eric your 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 solution can do this um, is is figuring out context right because that's those are like the fringe cases where where people get angry um, uh, is you know. So the the users have a legitimate gripe here, right? So they copyright law isn't supposed to stop them from using content for any purpose. There is something called fair use, um, and you know there's there's a reason that that's in the copyright law, which is supposed to be a balance. And so if um, if technology is just finding all matches and not thinking about the context, then all you know a, a potential fair use um, can can get over filtered or, or, and that, that's, you know, what one, that's what the user groups are, are calling it. Um, and it's, it's really difficult to, to figure out what is fair use. Courts get it wrong all the time or different courts, you know, come up with different solutions or different answers to the same question. So like if, if courts can't do this and they're looking at these factors, you know, how, you know, is it possible for technology to even to understand the context and, and find something when it is, you know, a, um, a, a fair use? Right. And with images, that's particularly an issue because courts have said to display a full image could be fair use, um, depending on the context. Whereas when you're usually looking at music or a film, it would probably never be fair use to display an entire film or play an entire song. So I think some other industries have been able to use uh, technology measures in a more robust way because they can set parameters. Like we will only you know, send notices on YouTube if there's more than X number of seconds or of a song or minutes of a film or something like that. Um, where with an image, um, it's very difficult. Uh, maybe motion clips could be better, but still they're also, you know, could be short. I, you know, it's just more challenging to handle fair use when an entire image can be fair use or it could be infringing. Yeah, and it, it's hard, like you can't just say, pick something like the size of the image. Like so, I, like um, the German implementation of Article 17 has has done that, or at least the the draft they're, they're you know saying it's you know, basically a permitted use if it's under if the image is under I think it's 250 kilobytes, which you know doesn't really make sense you know especially in the context of of platforms where they they're compressing images that users upload um, to to save bandwidth and you know it does. It, it's uh, it, it that is potentially uh, creating an exception that would um, over make make things more towards the the fair use side um, and and be totally unfavorable to rights holders when you know these things could actually be infringement. So uh, wow, I we've almost been going for an hour here. I know. I was, I was a little worried when we first started that um, that we weren't going to get discussion, but I think that uh, you know this this has been a really good discussion, and you know thank thank you everyone for um, for contributing. Um, so, but you know we only have a couple minutes left. So if there's something you're dying to say, now is the time to do it. Or or should we say if if 
uh, DMLA, sometimes I have been asked to speak on parts of 512C and talk about remedies and things like that. Is there anyone who um, has a sense of what's most important to the industry, what we should focus on, what you think would be the most helpful? Um, because one advantage of having association is that instead of your company being the voice, like you could use us as an umbrella voice. So it's important so we know your priorities. Oh, Doug would like me to mention that he thinks it would be helpful if we had some standard licensing agreements so things uh, it would be easier to use technical measures. And he is encouraging our legal team to look at having a universal RF um, agreement. So I promised him we would look at that. Uh, uh, yeah, and I do think that a lot, of, a lot of this, when you're thinking about the technical measures, has a lot to do with you know with rights management and you know uh, the 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 what what's happening in the industry with the Google licensable badge and CAI is can certainly help in this area because it's you know not only helping to um, to identify who the users are or sorry who the owners are. Um, for authentication purposes or potentially, you know, licensing, it, that that same metadata can be used um, to identify and and help, you know, um, help with this entire process of saying, you know, maybe instead of having to when you do your DMCA report uh, to identify that you are the owner, you can have the image, the metadata attached to that that make it very clear that that you are the owner. Um, and, and make the process a lot smoother. I think we did it. You wanna have the last word on it, Nancy? Oh, always wanna have the last word. No, just kidding. <laughs> 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 um, just thank everyone for participating and I'm glad to hear you know ideas from everyone else. We'll keep our fingers crossed on Case Act. I heard yesterday, we uh, DMLA, has a weekly call with the other visual arts associations as well as the Copyright Alliance. And Keith Kummerschmidt from the Copyright Alliance says there's some plans in trying to get the case act to the floor. Um, and so um, hopefully that would be a practical way where some of these 512 disputes could be resolved, take some pressure off, um, and then maybe we can you know, work on how we can work with some of the larger platforms as an industry so they're not taking everything down and we're not sending notices all the time I and mean, that i guess that would be the dream so uh and then and, you know just tell everyone to enjoy the rest of the conference and uh i think but there'll be uh the legal committee will have a follow-up tomorrow thank you everyone okay have a good evening bye